Yo, partnership alert, partnership alert, partnership alert. Living Corporate has a partnership with LinkedIn Learning, an American massive open online course provider that provides video courses taught by industry experts across a wide array of subjects. Now, the partnership is because Living Corporate has courses on LinkedIn Learning focused on diversity, equity, inclusion for leaders, career professionals, and anyone really looking to upskill themselves and be better allies. So make sure you check out our courses on LinkedIn Learning by clicking the link in the show notes. And let's just say you don't want to do that. You go to LinkedIn Learning on LinkedIn, search Live in Corporate. We'll be right there. All right. Peace. That's right. What's up, (laughs) y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And this week, we have another installation from our Pfizer Leadership Spotlight series, speaking with Tyrone McLean, a global leader at Pfizer. We had a really good conversation. I don't even want to, like, you know, take too much time away from the discussion because it was that great. I will say it's important in all of the work that we do, right? Whatever it is you're doing, right? It could be, I mean, again, a wide array of things. We don't just talk to DEI leaders here. We talk to all sorts of people. Shout out to ABC Wanager's See It To Be Be It series. Shout out to uh, the Tapping With Tristan and just shout out to the whole network of the types of content that we're creating here that centers and amplifies black and brown people. You can center and amplify black and brown people without using the words diversity, equity, and inclusion. You center and amplify black and brown people by talking about topics that are relevant to black and brown people at work. Now, I will say that it's important in whatever it is we're doing to come at the subject matter with a systems thinking mindset. Whatever you're doing is not existing or happening in a silo. Think through what it is that you're doing and how it connects to the bigger picture. There's nothing that you're doing that doesn't impact someone else that isn't dependent on some other group. And when you can start thinking in a systems context, you're able to then make systemic impacts, right? It's important as we continue to grow, you hear, you should be hearing even like in the language when I interview these leaders and le- interview these thought leaders. And, and fr- frankly, in all the content that we create at Living Corporate is that we're always talking about systems and structures. We're rarely ever talking about and hyper-focusing on an individual or an individual act. We're always connecting that individual or individual act to the broader systemic impact. And so when you listen to this conversation, I'm just really thankful for Tyrone and and his time. And shout out to all the Tyrones in the world. Shout out to my Uncle Tyrone, who's his birthday recently. Happy belated, Uncle. Love you, man. Um, But um, really great conversation, especially as we think about this uh, Delta variant and its impact, its continued impact disparate impact on black and brown communities, especially those with uh, pre-existing conditions. And I love, I just love our dialogue. So before we get into the conversation with Tyrone, we're going to tap in with Tristan. I'll see you in a second. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. Today, I want to talk to you about how to optimize your meetings for hybrid work. By now, we all know the pandemic has permanently changed the landscape of work. As many offices begin to reopen, the hybrid work model has become a top solution to address the needs for flexible work. According to PwC, about 55% of employees would prefer to be remote at least three days a week. And according to Cisco, moving forward, 98% of meetings will include participants joining from home. One of the many challenges this model of work presents is how to have productive and engaging meetings that don't waste time and resources when part of the attendees are in the office and the other part are joining from Zoom. Well, one thing that needs to stop is the habit of blocking off large chunks of time and inviting everyone you can think of just in case, then hoping for the best. Instead of one hour meetings with as many people as possible, try using shorter meeting times, creating an agenda with no more than three things you wanna touch on in 30 minutes, and even sending information ahead of time for review. 
This will lead to more focused and productive meetings. It'll also force you to determine exactly who needs to join these meetings. We also need to be intentional with meetings, meaning we need to know which meetings to keep and which ones to cancel or turn into an email. If your meeting is to discuss reporting, provide status updates or announcements, or gain feedback, you might want to consider canceling it and having the conversation asynchronously via email or Slack. If it's really important, you can attach a deadline for those you're requesting something from. A good measure is to ask yourself, will this meeting mainly be one person talking or will it involve two-way communication? If it's the former, consider canceling. If it's the latter, then keep it. Since it's no longer feasible to regularly gather everyone in the same room while working in a hybrid workplace, I suggest you avoid having your remote colleagues come onto a call with a crowded conference room of in-person colleagues. Doing this could create a rift and make your colleagues feel like an outsider. I suggest you adopt the model, if one of us dials in, we all dial in. This can level the playing field and help your team feel more connected, included, and engaged. Lastly, take some time to step up your virtual presentation game. Now that we are a year and a half into working this way, showing up on camera is simply the bare minimum. Make sure you have a good home setup, including decent internet connection, camera, lighting, audio, and set. Also, consider incorporating virtual collaboration tools in your presentation to make the meetings more engaging. As the world of work changes, it's important that we reassess the habits and traditions we formed and adapt to our current needs. I hope these tips help. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Tyrone, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good, fam. How are you? I'm really happy to be here. Man, I'm good. I'm good. Um, you know, it's interesting, like, we're having this conversation in the middle of this panoramic, man. Like, my uh, my daughter, her daycare recently shut down because uh, one of the one of the kids was uh, tested positive for COVID. She's 17 months old. Uh, so you, you said before we before we started recording, you said you had a son. How old is your son? He's 16. You know, he's 16. Wow. But fortunately, you know, he's I'm in Atlanta. He's in school. And when he was out of school during the pandemic, we didn't have some of the child care issues because he was mm -hmm. old enough to take care of himself. So, Word. yo, blessings to you, brother. Blessings. <laughs> So your child is so how so wait so Tyrone what you like you you look like a a smooth uh twenty eight hey I don't know who paid you to say that but thank you brother I'm what's going on you got the which is a lot of water or what I drink a lot of a lot of water water you know I get it from my mama you know she's a fountain of youth so you know I'm actually twelve years older than what you said and um I got married in uh, twenty nineteen and prior to being married my wife had a son so it's my son he's a great kid got you got death. you because. I'm over here like, yo, like that is wild. Like this man don't look a lick over 30. So I'm Thank just like, you. but it's a blessing though. It's straight up. Like don't crack, right? <laughs> it, it, no, it, it bends sometimes if you play around too much, but yeah, You're I right. agree with you. Uh, so look, um, let me start with the first question that came to me when I when I peeped your profile on, on LinkedIn. You know, you're a global director at, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, the most well-known pharmaceutical company in the world. Why are you pursuing an MBA right now? Zach, that's really funny and a great question. I get that frequently. Matter of fact, from a lot of my business colleagues, and I'm going to mm -hmm. answer it two ways, um, you know, personally and professionally. Um, so professionally, coming from a world that I was in the public sector mm -hmm. and being in government for a long time, I think that I felt as though there were certain skill sets that I needed going into the corporate world, you know, working closely with the business to really understand some of the business strategies that they're business strategies that they're looking to pursue. Why are they making those decisions? Because me understanding that language and those decision makings, I'm more effective in my job, whereas though I'm able to provide the patient perspective, but also give them the lens of what policymakers are looking at. You know, so mm -hmm. I thought that was really, really important. Number two, you know, let's be real, you know, as a black person trying to break the medical forical, you know, glass ceiling, there's mm -hmm. always impediments in a way that you try to keep you from living out or reaching your destiny. So I wanted to remove any burdens that were in the way that said he didn't have the right experience or the uh, right education. And then finally, I would say, um, from a personal perspective, 
my aunt, God rest her soul, um, she was huge into education. She always thought that education was a way to provide financial freedom for yourself and the family. Um, and her having only a high school degree, she was always a proponent of me, you know, Tyrone, go ahead and be an example for the family. Get you, go graduate from college, be the first in your family, but also when you, when you put yourself in a position to get an advanced degree, go ahead and do that. And the day before we uh, lost her, you know, I made a promise. So I want to fulfill that. So I just hope she's proud. Man, I, that's beautiful. And I hear you. I hear you about, I hear all of your rationale and all your reasonings. Um, I just think it's wild. Cause like Pfizer is so big. It's like, I feel like that's like your stamp. Now, if you wanted to go and be like, I don't know, like a professional rugby player, mm -hmm. I can understand you might want to get some, but I'm saying like, you got the brand, like, but I hear you and it's in your, in your right. The reality um, of our experiences is that, you know, we often need uh, additional credentials. And then to your point, like around education, that resonates with me because um, I'm the first man on my mom's side of the family to start and graduate from a four year university. My older cousin, he graduated from college, but he started as a JUCO. So like, I'm still a first, uh, but he beat me by just by merit of uh, him being two years old, a couple years older. So that's, that's beautiful. Um, you know, it's been nearly, four years for you at Pfizer. Mm -hmm. um, what brought you here and what's keeping you here? Yeah, so what brought me here? That's a really good question too as well. So after um, the previous presidential campaign, I was really burnt out. Um, I was in, you know, running campaigns, one shape or the form, you know, for since I graduated from college, you know, I was working in a municipality. I was a district chief of staff for a congressman. And I felt as though I was doing good work and I was helping people, um, but I was at the point that I needed to move on and I needed to do something more. And this opportunity presented itself to, to come work at Pfizer, which to your point is a well-known brand, you know, a company that I always wanted to work, work for. Um, and being at the company, I would tell you, you know, not only is it important for me to be passionate about anything that I do, but as you heard from the previous podcast, um, the people at Pfizer are amazing. You know, not only are they really smart, you know, and they are inspiring, but their dedication to providing patient access and doing what's best for the patient is admirable. You know, coming from a government sector, you kind of think, so I was, oh, I don't know about those folks. When you come in, you start to really realize that. But also, you know, working at an organization like Pfizer that's always constantly innovating, um, I think it's really important to have diverse stakeholders in those rooms where you're talking about addressing patient access and, uh, hate, um, you know, racial inequities. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, like this has been so informative for me, mm -hmm. like selfishly, right? Like, it's like, man, I just learned so much about the roles that Pfizer has invested in for the sake of equity um, and really making sure, or at least supporting, mm -hmm. you know, equitable patient care. You know, it's interesting. You do exist in rarefied air. How do you, if at all, you've already kind of, you've alluded to it already, but like, how do you manage any pressure to exist as a global leader, as a mentor, as an example, and frankly, as a representative to so many unheard voices? And what I would imagine is a white space. You're right. I, you know, before you came on, folks were saying, yo, Tyrone is that guy, like he has a cult following, people really like him, you know what I'm saying? He has the freshest J's, his edge up is always really on point. Um, his, his skin is very uh, hydrated. So like, how do you, it sound, it, you know, and I say this to someone who I feel like I can relate to an extent, but like, how do you manage existing in all these different places simultaneously? Man, rarefied air. I don't even really think about it that way. I just do my job. Um, but I would say that managing stress is definitely a work in progress. You know, I must uh, admit that, you know, especially having to do, do reality of being a black man working at Pfizer and in my commitments to my community. Um, so there's a couple of ways that I try to manage my stress and I've been doing a lot better at it is one, I've been adamant about taking vacation time. You know, previously I would work through vacations and really wouldn't take that time because that's how I was wired, especially coming from a government sector, whereas though 
you're the guy it has to get done. Um, Another thing I've been doing is making sure throughout the day, I take two hours to myself, just eat was to have lunch, work out, do some thinking to myself, whatever it may, may be, you know, I'm definitely using that time to recharge my battery. And I would say the last thing that I, that I, that I really do and I focus on, and I kind of laugh at, and I guess it's an opportunity to give a shout out to uh, Gozetta Business School, is that prior to everybody um, starting business school, we have to take a Berkman test. And what the mm. Berkman test does is, you know, it, it evaluates, you know, your usual behaviors, your interests, and your stress behaviors. And for me, I thought it was interesting because I laughed at it at first, like, what this Berkman gonna take teach me? But it's taught me how to be more effective, you know, and how I come across and what my stress behaviors look like. So once I look at, once I see that. I try to reel myself back in and make time, as I said, to do the things that I need to do to make sure I'm as effective as, a, as, uh, as possible. You know, it's it's interesting. Do you feel as if there's pressure for you to be accessible and be a mentor to everybody? Like, you know, like like I would imagine that because of your profile, black folks, black and brown folks gravitate towards you. Like, how do you manage the the demand of accessibility as a leader and sitting where you sit uh to tell you the truth um i don't think people reach out to me enough to tell you the truth uh to be honest with you because yeah. i mean one thing listen after 2020 one thing that came in perspective is that i need to do do more and doing more can mean a lot of things and one of the things i really looked at is being more selfless with my time and giving back not only just doing a good job and opening the doors behind opening the doors behind me but if they don't know how i got there how are they mm. going to get there it doesn't matter if i open these doors up not, uh, uh, not uh, open these doors up or not so mm. i like being selfless with my time and making time to talk to people matter of fact um my son plays for AAU sponsored Adidas team. I even volunteered to be a coach to work with young men, you know, his age to give them a couple of jewels and the tools they need to be successful. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't mind those demands. The demands that more difficult to me is being more accessible is within Pfizer dealing with health equity and trying to be everything and answer questions, knowing that we're not monolithic. <laughs> right. No, a hundred percent. Um, you know, it's funny when we first started this series, the COVID vaccine was not funny. It's it's just wild, actually, how time is going on. I started off talking about how COVID has even just impacted and continues to impact my immediate family and my household. Mm. Um, you know, when we started the series, the COVID vaccines were just really starting to get into full swing. Um, I want to say it only been like a we'd only like about a couple, maybe maybe a month in, like we this when this series first started. Now we have a whole new variant of the disease, mm. which is not shocking for anyone who's really been paying attention. The fact that the the um the experts were saying that this is what happens with um if like this this was not it's not unforeseeable but still it's like you know so much has happened i'm curious what your journey has been over the last 18 months specifically um not just as the global director of public affairs for oncology at Pfizer but as a black man as well you know like what if anything has been keeping you up at night oh i don't know if we have enough time um to, to, to really answer that question, you know? So I try uh, to condense it. Um, okay. You know, one is, as I alluded to early on, is uh, am I doing enough at my job? You know, am I communicating effectively? Am I opening up the doors? Am I being selfless with my time? You know, to make sure that I'm opening up opportunity, creating space for people who look like me to be successful. You know, then on the other hand, if we look at, you know, just the summer of 2020, you know, I have a 16 year old son that's six, three, that looks like a grown man. You know, he's at the age that he's starting to drive. So how do I balance that, you know, to teach him the things he needs to know when he's out and not in, you know, he's not with me, you know, what are, what are the things you need to do if you get pulled over, how you should be conducting yourself out there, you know, which is really important, but also giving the flexibility to be a teenager to make some mistakes, whereas though he probably doesn't really have the luxury. And then on the back end, if you look at this pandemic, you know, um, before anything, you know, I am, you know, a son of New Hallville, New Hallville, Elm City, New Haven, Connecticut, you know, and there's a lot of people in New Haven, Bridgeport, Connecticut in general that I really care about. And when you talk to them about this COVID, this COVID, uh, COVID-19, 
their understanding of what that means, how it impacts them is really troubling to me because on one end, they say, I don't want to take the vaccine because of things that happened in the past. I definitely, you know, understand that. When you break down that argument, you get through that, then it goes, you know, emergency use. You know, I, I don't believe in emergency use. So you explain to them what emergency use means, you know, and why we have it. You know, now we have the FDA approval. Now the thought is it may be change it. But my concern is if we had obstacles through those first two, knowing that people you knew and loved were dying, what is going to be the difference now that we have the FDA approved vaccination? So that really keeps me up at night and trying to think of the best way to communicate that and being a representation of my community. You know, to that, to your point around our community, I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read this from the American Cancer Society and I'll put the link in the show notes for folks who want to um, like read it in depth, but I'm going to, I'm going to read a portion of it here. African Americans have a higher cancer burden and, and face greater obstacles to cancer prevention, detection, treatment, and survival. In fact, Black people have the highest death rate and shortest survival of any racial ethnic group for most cancer in the U.S. Um, for most cancer in the U.S. Research has shown that African Americans experience more illness, worse outcomes, premature death compared to whites. African Americans have the highest death rate and shortest survival of any racial ethnic group. Ethnic group for most cancers. African American men also have the highest cancer incidence. Cancer rates in Black men is twice as high as in Asians and Pacific Islanders, who have the lowest rates. Prostate cancer rate death rates in black men are more than double those of every other racial ethnic group. Black women are 40% more likely to die of breast cancer than white women and are twice as likely to die if they are over 50. About a third of African American women reported experiencing racial discrimination at a healthcare health provider visit. Living in segregated communities in areas highly populated with African Americans has been associated with increased chances of getting diagnosed with cancer after it has spread, along with having higher death rates and lower rates of survival from breast and lung cancer. So with all these things in mind, which I am sure that you are intimately aware, what is Pfizer doing to address cancer disparities in the Black community and how, if at all, has COVID impacted Pfizer's focus in this regard? So this is a really great question. You talk about, you know, our previous question, what keeps me up at night? Exactly those statistics. I know them very well. And it's troubling because, you know, when you think about it, a lot of this comes down to the social determinants of health. When you look at education, housing, food, you know, access to great food, uh, food in general. So I would say, you know, a couple of things is one is, you know, Pfizer has a long history in trying to address health inequities, you know, um, a storied history of, uh, of a couple of things that we have, we have tried to try to do, but, um, a couple of things, you know, more specific to the oncology, you know, a uh, business unit that we've been looking to address. So one, given our history and in, in the ways in which we tried to address it, we also realized that there was still a white space out there that we weren't addressing. And rather than us looking from our perspective on how we should address health equity, we brought in, you know, uh, patients, patient advocates to hear from them on what they think is important and how we should be addressing this. So we created a Pfizer Oncology patient centricity ecosystem. And we had uh, patients across different tumor types to come in to help us with three specific areas. One was health literacy, two was clinical trials, and three was um, health equity to tell us how we should be looking at it. What are they doing to address it? How we should be addressing it? Because it's very important to hear from them on the ground on what they're doing and how we should be addressing this. So we started this ecosystem in 2019 and over the two years we worked and you know it surpassed anything that we thought we'd be able to accomplish. Matter of fact, just recently we released a white, white paper with them on what they thought or how we should address these three specific areas. That's on Pfizer.com. So we're really proud of that. So that's one way we're really reaching out to re, you know, to readdress like how we should be thinking about, you know, health inequities. Another thing we did to get to uh, one of your questions you got to is 2020 put a lot of things in the forefront. Things as black men and women that we always seen, but I think being at home, not I think, being at home where we can really see and we had time to think about it, that gave everyone an opportunity to readdress and rethink about how we're dealing with, you know, health equity, recruitment, et cetera. 
So my uh, the global oncology president and the North American uh, president, they convene a small group of uh, black colleagues just to check in with them on how you're doing, how you're feeling, what you're, mm -hmm. you know, you know, how are you dealing with this? What resources do you need? How can we help you? Which I thought was very courageous at a time, you know, not being of the community to take that step. I thought it was a very important step because they're empowered to really make the effective change that we need. So I love that first step. But during that conversation, um, a lot of colleagues started talking about how we address health, health equity, you know, they felt as though that we were over indexed on the same organizations and the change that we really need to they need to see wasn't being addressed because a lot of this comes down to access, education, et cetera. So the global president and North America president and my supervisor came to me and they asked me to do an oncology advocacy audit to look at how we partner in people, you know, what our spins is, the success over the years. And I would tell it was very enlightening, some of the things that we that I, I found. Um, there's a couple of recommendations that we are actually pulling through right now with their blessing that, you know, um, that we're starting to change. So I would say, you know, right now we're in a situation where as though everything is on the table, they're open to brainstorming, but I think the key is what's our role to play and what's going to be sustainable. As a black man, I don't want to come in this place and do something and jump out and it's not sustainable. So we're doing a lot around that, I would say. It's encouraging, you know, you think about just even this season where, you know, there's all these reports of, of ICU beds being taken up, mm -hmm. right? And like, it doesn't change the fact that there are all, there's, all, there's a huge population of people who are already sick mm -hmm. and who need care. And so, you know, it's just, it's just concerning to me, uh, but it's exciting to hear you know, that there's tangible things that Pfizer is doing um, in that regard. You know, I feel like with those stats in mind, the fact that you said these things keep you up at, at night, I feel like you have to have some degree of hope to do this work and like for it not to just completely burn you out. Um, you know, as you look at the next 18 months, like what gives you the most hope? And then on the flip side of that, what gives you, if anything, uh, pause? You know, I would say I'm always an eternal optimist. You know, as I said, I start out, I have to be passionate about whatever I'm doing. And for me, the passion is how far can I push it? And, you know, how far can I push the limits? But also more importantly, and I, am I still being effective in my role, you know, giving back and doing the things that need to be done? And I would say over the, you know, these 18 months, what I'm excited about is that we have a couple of launches that are upcoming that have high, have high racial disparities. And there's several conversations about how do we address access? How do we address health inequities? What do we do that's sustainable? Um, that keeps me really encouraged about that because um, if we weren't having these conversations, given everything that happened in 2020 and we weren't putting our money where our mouth was, I would be very concerned. So I think that gives me the most excitement, but also more importantly, you know, my supervisor, who I have to give a shout out to, Albert Biero, who always encouraged me and tell me, speak your mind. You're here for a reason. You have great experience. Is always encouraging me to go into those conversations and doing what I do best. Why I got here is why they want me here. So um, I think that's very encouraging, you know, with the different conversations that I'm having and the things that I'm being asked to do that it can, is going to have, I think, is going to have an impact on our community. I would say on the back end that really keeps me uh, up at night is that a lot has changed due to the pandemic, um, the way in which we work, you know, how we're speeding up things to come to the market, um, the way we're thinking about things. And, you know, to a certain degree, I love the idea of having a first mover advantage. We're out there. We know what the landscape is, you know, when it comes to patients. Um, and I'm only talking about patient centric activities in in my world. You know, when we think about how we engage with patient advocates, I don't want anybody to think I'm thinking about commercial or anything else. I'm talking about my world the entire time. Um, so my concern is if we're out there, we have first mover, mover advantage and we're not vetting these things properly and we're not getting the right input, you know, is this really what's in our best interest? Is this really what the patients really want? Are these things sustainable? Are we duplicating efforts? So I would say that's the thing that gives me the most pause. And I sometimes, 
you know, I feel as though some of my colleagues get upset with me because in my role dealing with patient advocates, but also the reputational impact that it can have, sometimes I have to reel them back in and it comes across as though, you know, I'm not being a good team player. It's not. It's just that my North Star is always, you know, what's, you know, in the best interest of the patients, but also health equity. So every time I get concerned about something and I'm not sure it's right, I go point back to my North Star and I try to redirect the conversation. So I would say those are the things that kind of keep me up and keep me worried over these next 18 months. Tyrone, this has been a dope conversation, man. I mean, everyone was, again, had some people clamoring like, yo, Tyrone, <laughs> we got to get Tyrone. So I appreciate the fact uh, that you were able to be a guest with us today. Before I let you go, any parting words, any shout outs? Listen, I, I want to say thank you very much for, first of all, for having me. Um, this is not something I do. You know, I'm normally a person that likes to play the background. I don't like to be so forward speaking. But um, uh, one of my big supporters, Mia, um, really encouraged me to do that. So I really thank, thank her. But I also want to thank, you know, my corporate affairs team that I work with, you know, my mentor, you know, my supervisor, the oncology team, my extended team, my commercial colleagues. I would say, you know, over these four years, this has been very rewarding. Um, and I honestly didn't know I was going to be here this long because it was just so new to me. But coming in and seeing how we work and the things we're able to do and the impact we have to be able to have on patient is truly admirable. And I would just say to everybody, you know, these next nine to 18 months are not going to be easy, but let's not forget our North Star and what brought us brought us here. Patience, patience, patience. But again, you know, thank you so much for having me. Tyrone, man, look, it's been a pleasure. You can see you're a friend of the show. Uh, shout out to, man, all the work that you're doing, and we'll catch you soon. Yes. Thank you very much. Peace. And we're back. Yo, shout out to Tyrone McLean. And I didn't think I would really say this. Like when I, you know, we think about where Living Corporate started, which was nothing. It was a startup a couple years ago as a single podcast. I'm, I'm really about to say this. Shout out to Pfizer <laughs> for being a partner in this series and uh, working with Living Corporate to spotlight uh, their leaders. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say this at the end of the series. You may hear more in the future. I just want to say thank you to the entire Pfizer team, the group there uh, working with us, allowing us the opportunity uh, to spotlight your leaders and have some really frank conversations. You know, I'll say uh, that it's easy. A lot of brands reach out and they really want to kind of shape and control how these conversations go because they like living corporate. But some folks want to take the edge off of what we say and what we do to serve their own purposes. And I'm just not really here for that. Right? Like living corporate is uh, started from passion. It started from a desire to really have the frank conversations that corporate America simply won't allow themselves to have. So I'm not really here to be policed. Um, with that being said, I just I'm really surprised uh, in a pleasant way uh, that we were able to make this happen and and have these incredible dialogues. I'll say another thing is if you enjoy these dialogues and, and you see them as a point of learning. I would, one, tell you to share uh, Living Corporate's podcast with your network and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Like, that is a huge thing, right? Like We have merch and we have all kinds of stuff. You can see in the show notes ways that we, you know, we generate revenue. I will say, really, that the five-star reviews are extremely important, right? They mean just as much to me as you getting a hoodie. They mean just as much to me um, as you getting a mug. They are critical for living corporates continued growth and success especially as we expand and drop new podcasts that we're going to be announcing uh, later in september so i will say that um, if you enjoy our content and you see it as a point of learning please share it again with your network and then on top of that you can actually check out our content on linkedin learning which takes some of these really dynamic discussions around all these different pieces that you hear and you continue to hear us talk about over the last three years. And they actually um, are turned into learning modules. And so you're able to learn and your engagement on those learning modules actually directly supports living corporate. Right. So not only are you learning or not only are you sharing content for other people to learn, but you're actually and actively tangibly supporting living corporate and our effort to continue to grow and um, 
and center and amplify black and brown voices at work. So again, this is a thank you. This is a FYI. And uh, look, we do listener letters next week. We're going to be doing some listener letters. Uh, we haven't done them in a while. They've stacked up. So we're going to answer a few. <laughs> Transparently, y'all, that's my fault. Y'all remember like when T-Pain, he didn't understand how Instagram worked and he went to like message requests. And it was like all these people reached out to him. I didn't check something in my inbox and like all these emails, like all these listener letters. So we're going to be doing listener letters for a while. Um, expect that to come back as part of the show. Anyway, this has been Zach. You've been listening to Living Corporate. Again, shout out to Pfizer. Catch y'all later. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.